So a lot of people think that when they that when they start a bodybuilder diet, it's actually the, the vegetables that make them fart a lot. It's really not. Here's how you lose body fat. Ready? You eat less and you exercise more. Be the change, like as Gandhi said, be the change you want to be in the world. Do you listen to music while working out? If I am training on my own, yes, I do. I wear my beats. If I'm not training on my own, I'm training with Mark, then no, I don't listen to music because I talk, talk to Mark. And people always ask like, what do I listen to whenever I listen to music? Well, I grew up in the kind of the raving era because I'm nearly 40. So everything I listen to is like banging house music and like kind of rave music because it really gets my, my juices flowing. So that's what I listen to when I train. Okay, Christy is asking, do you do each exercise a set before moving on to the next or do you do them in a circuit? Okay, so this is a really common question that I get asked. Um, I should probably like make a blog post about it. So uh, no, I you always do your exercises in a set. You never do them in a circuit because, not you never do them in a circuit, but whenever you're training the way I'm training and bodybuilding, you, what you want to do is you want to do um, each exercise lifting progressively heavier. So if you are doing four sets of leg curls, lying leg curls, okay? You start off at a certain weight, which is your first two sets are really your warm up sets. And then your next two sets will be what we call your working sets. So your first set, um, as a general rule of thumb, you should have maybe 10 to 15 reps left in the bank once you've finished your first, your first set, okay? Your second set, you should only have maybe five to seven, probably, yeah, five to seven left in the bank. So it actually should feel still pretty easy. By your third set, we call this your first working set. So you should probably at the end of your first working set only really have two reps left in the bank. So which basically means that if say you're doing chest presses, if you're pushing, right? It means that you have two more, you could probably do two more reps, but you couldn't do any more. Your final set is your failure set. You always wanna to go to failure on your final set. And by I mean failure, I don't just mean like it's, there's a difference between it's hard and it's failure, okay? And many people get confused between the two. So what happens is people go, you know, I, so perfect example, I was watching a girl one day, one of the, a girl in my program, and she posted a video of herself doing squats on the Smith. And so she said, you know, oh, I just, you know, I hit failure in my final set. And it's funny because she did, she went like, you know, five, four, she did like one, two, three, and she did four. And then she went down with the bar back, she went like this and she went down and she kind of got halfway and she went, oh, she started to struggle and she went, boom, she racked the bar. And I was like, and I, no, that was like, she'd only just started to work at that point. She hadn't, she hadn't hit failure. She just started to struggle. It was hard. Like if she had to put in a wee bit more effort, she could have got to the top and she could have done two more reps. So I was like, no, 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 no. Seriously, you guys aren't understanding what failure means. Failure doesn't mean, oh, it got hard. Failure means I can't possibly move my body part one more inch. So if you're doing lying leg curls, right? I I do lying leg curls. When I hit failure, like I'm maybe hitting 12 reps, right? But Mark sometimes just makes me keep going. I've seen myself doing 20 to 25 reps with 170 pounds on a lying leg curl. I kid you not, at the end, my legs were only moving this much. They were like, ee, ee, ee. And then people go, oh, but you weren't moving through full range of motion. And I'm like, you don't need to move through full range of motion in your final set. I mean, do you, or do you mean to tell me that it's better to stop at six reps because you can't get full range of motion on the seventh than it is to get another 20 reps in with half range of motion? In half range of motion, the, the muscle is still working, okay? It's still working. And um, if you've got 170 pounds on that, See that or in that line leg curl, there's no way you're getting full range of motion for 20 reps. So the thing is, keep going, okay? So keep going until you hit failure. Like if you, if you, or else set it down and do another set. So you never want to stop until you reach concrete muscle failure. So that's why we do each exercise as, as a set before moving on to the next one, because you want to burn out the muscle. If you are moving around in a circuit, you're never going to be able to lift really heavy in one exercise. So you're never really going to hit the muscle hard and make it grow. So never as a circuit, always as a set. That's how, I build, how bodybuilders train. Uh, here we are, another big question I get asked. Cellulite help. I have less than 15% body fat and I still have it on my thighs and booty. Do you know, cellulite, a lot of people say to me, oh, how do you get rid of cellulite? And I said, well, here's the thing, right? Cellulite was invented. A lot of people don't know this. It was invented in the 1970s to spawn a whole market of new creams and lotions and potions to get rid of cellulite. But like I tell people all the time, cellulite is just fat. It's not, it's not like some mystical thing that just like appeared in the 1970s that they discovered in women. Cellulite is just fat. Now, unfortunately, women suffer from cellulite more than men simply because we have more subcutaneous fat, which basically means fat under the, under the skin. 
men have more internal body fat, which is why if a man puts on a lot of weight, sometimes he can get a great big round belly. Do you ever see guys with like a great big belly, right? You don't really see it with women so much, but you see it with men. And the reason why they have a great big round belly is because they have a massive amount of intestinal fat. That's fat around their internal organ organs, which is absolutely horrifying, okay? Horrifying. So, but men tend to hold their body fat inward. And there's a lot of um, theory to suggest that it's because men used to go out and be the hunter gatherers. So they used to go out and like hunt and gather and, you know, go for long distances. So they needed fat around their internal organs in order to keep their internal organs more insulated. Whereas women tended to not go off and hunt the tigers. We tended to sit around in groups and gather and cook and look after the children. So therefore we need, needed more fat actually on our butts because we were constantly sitting on them and we were squatting down. And also, you know, we were always sitting breastfeeding the children and all those kinds of things. So we have evolved to have fat on certain parts of our body and men have fat in certain parts of their body more internally and women have it more externally. How do you get rid of cellulite? You just lose body fat. So you're saying you 15% body fat, you still have it in your thighs. I still have cellulite, okay? I have cellulite in my bum too. Like if I tense my bum, I was actually, I was thought the other day, I'm gonna do a photo of my cellulite. If I squeeze my butt, which means that I'm squeezing the muscles in it, and so therefore the skin is all tightening in, I have cellulite in my butt too. Every woman generally has cellulite, okay? Even the skinniest of women, when they get older, they get cellulite. It's nothing mystical, it's just fat. There's no fascia busters or anything is gonna break it down. Seriously, rubbing your thighs with a bloody rod with prongs on it is not going to get rid of cellulite, guys. It's another marketing ploy, really. The only way to get rid of body fat, get rid of cellulite, is to lose body fat, okay? Now, sometimes it can take several years for the cellulite to go and stay off permanently, but it does go and it does stay off permanently eventually. So just, you need to lose more body fat and you need to just get used to the fact that women are just going to have body fat. Okay, A1 Davison, you homeschool what you think is fab, but how do you feel about your kids going to university? If my kids want to go to university, I would never stop them, but I would make, it pay, I would make them pay for it themselves because I don't believe that university is useful unless you're actually going to study a degree like medicine or um, dentistry or whatever. Because here's the thing about schools and teaching and universities and all that. Years ago, if you wanted to learn how to do something, you just find someone who was really, really, really good at it and you asked them to teach you. Or if you wanted to learn how to be a blacksmith, you, and even today, if you want to learn how to be a blacksmith or a farrier, you go and do an apprenticeship, okay? So there's a lot of, the problem, the problem is they professionalized careers, such as, you know, being a doctor or a lawyer or a dentist or things like that, and so therefore they close them off to people who actually would make amazing doctors because they love medicine and they love, you know, all of that. They made it more Ivy League, okay? It's very expensive to go to law school. It's very expensive to go, you know, to medical school. It's very expensive to get all that. So they closed it off to everybody but the elite. There's a whole massive, oh, epidemic. There's, I read an amazing book about this years ago. So I don't believe in university, to be honest. I went to university. I got, um, I scraped a 2-2, two -two. I nearly got a third, which is the lowest possible um, degree you can get. Like, I think I got like 49.5% and they like bumped me up to 50 so that I could, in my final exam, so that I could get, um, so that I could actually graduate with a 2-2 two -two and not a third, which was like disgraceful. But like, I got a first in partying. I spent my whole time in university partying. I remember nothing from my business studies degree except the, uh, what do I remember? Something from law, the uh, Seal of Goods Act, 1979. And the only reason why I remember the Seal of Goods Act is because I remember it being useful. I remember thinking, oh, this means that I can like fight with like shop assistants who say that I can't take back like my shoes if they're faulty, you know? And so I, I remember about an, an invitation to treat and I remember about the Seal of Goods Act and that's it. I remember nothing else from university. Nothing I learned in university has helped me be, run the business, start and grow the business I have today. Zero, nada, nothing. Now, if my kids want to go and waste four or five years of their life in university, I'm never going to stop them, but I'm certainly not going to pay for it. So, um, but if they want to become a doctor, and I get this question all the time, but what if your kids want to become a doctor or a lawyer? I'm like, let me tell you, it's my job as a homeschooling mom to, to give my kids the opportunity to become whatever they want to become. So if one of my kids is showing an aptitude for medicine or an aptitude for the law, then I will do everything within my power to get them there but they have to prove to me that they want it, that they love it, and that they're willing to work for it. My kids will not, you know, I, I, I see so many doctors who truly just don't love medicine. And I say to them, and I, I, I love questioning people, why do you do what you do? Why did you become what you become? And you know what a lot of them say to me? They say to me, like, it, they, they, like well, specifically, I'm thinking of one, one girl I met years ago. And I said to her, what do you do? And she said, well, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, I'm training to become a cardiologist. She said, I'm a, she was a registrar at the time. 
And I said, oh, that's so interesting. I said, I, you know, my mom has a good friend who's a cardiologist and, you know, and blah, blah, blah. And I said, you know, why did you want to go into the heart and whatever? And she was like, well, yeah, you know, I, I don't know. I just, I, I suppose like I had to specialize in something. And I was like, really? And I said, but, you know, but do you like, do you love, you know, what do you love about medicine? And what? And I was like, you know, expected her to be all, oh my God, the heart's so fascinating. And because I love the internal body. So if you get me to start talking about the liver, if you were a liver doctor, I would literally pin you down and I would corner you and I would ask you everything about the liver. I would have so much joy talking about the liver because I am a total geek about things like that. And I was trying to get this girl to like, you know, trying to get her excitement for cardiology and for, and she said to me, and I, and I couldn't get any excitement out of her. And I said to her, why did you become a doctor? And she said, um, I don't know. I just, I, I got really good grades in school. And I suppose it, like, doesn't everyone become like a doctor, a lawyer, a dentist when they get good grades? And I remember I said to my husband on the way home, I said, I am actually just disheartened with humanity now. I said, truly, you know, I was so ideological. I was, you know, in my twenties and I just started my, you know, my first online business. And I was so passionate about what I do. And and I, I realized as I began to like talk to more doctors and dentists and lawyers and professional careers that you need to go to university for, that truly the people who are working in these kinds of jobs don't work in them because they love the law or they're passionate about the heart or they're like, you know, like the kidneys fascinate them. They became doctors because they got good grades in school. And I think that the world would be a much better place if we were working in an area where we were truly passionate and we were truly um you know, excited, like I, bodybuilding excites me. The human body excites me, the liver excites me, like working out how to maximize muscle gains excites me, like nutrition excites me, it excites me. So I'm driven every day to do more, see more, have more, learn more. Imagine if we had a world full of doctors that were like that, okay? So university for me or college or whatever it is in America is more, you know, it, it, it runs deeper than just like, do I want my kids to go to university? I don't want my kids, I don't want anything for my kids. I want my kids to be happy, first and foremost. I want them to live their lives with joy. And if they earn, you know, 20,000 a year doing something that brings them the ultimate joy, then I think they've won. He who has the most joy wins, as far as I'm concerned. I don't want my kids to be, you know, multi-millionaires. And money doesn't make you happy. Does it make things easier? Yes. Does making millions whenever you're doing what you love feel absolutely awesome? Yes. But is it like the pinnacle? You know, I know a lot of miserable accountants. I know a lot of miserable doctors. I know a lot of people who are, you know, who like stockbrokers who are like self-medicating just to get through the day. Seriously, it doesn't make you happy. And so I, I don't want them to go to university or college or have any kind of formal education unless it serves their goal, unless it serves what they are working towards. And I will never force them in a direction that I believe they should go in. I will support whatever it is they want for themselves. And I fully expect that that is going to be multifaceted. I fully expect it's going to start off as one thing and it's going to move to another thing and move to another thing. You know, I, that's why I, I didn't discover what I wanted to do until I was 37, 37. And when I discovered what I wanted to do and I started to do it within two years, my business turned over more than seven figures. People used to say to me, what do you love, Kim? What do you love? You know, do what you love. What are you passionate about? And I used to say, I'm only passionate about muscles. Like I love muscles. I love looking at muscles. I love feeling muscles. I love being muscular. I love muscular women. I just loved anything, muscular men. I just, you know, had such an appreciation for the human body with muscles. And it wasn't until I was 37, I started training in the gym that I finally figured out what I wanted to do. So I fully expect my kids to have like a very, you know, um, wiggly line to success because that is what it takes to be successful. You don't get a job, go to college, follow, you know, and, and then, you know, work in, in one job and get a career and then retire and die, which is what we're taught. We're supposed, the, the line is supposed to be wiggly, okay? Someone's saying, Lydia's saying you're like my soul sister, this is how I feel. Yeah, you know, truly, happiness, like we have enough doctors and lawyers and dentists in the world, but you know what we're severely lacking in? Happy people. Happy, fulfilled, joyful people is what the world is lacking. We have plenty of professional people in the world and we have a massive, massive lack of happy people. So I want my kids first and foremost to be happy and whatever they choose to have as their career after they are happy, if it makes them happy, then I'm over the moon. Today Anna is asking, uh, or Anne McLean, um, you're amazing. I think you're amazing. Love all your gym advice. What do you have for breakfast, please? Every single morning I have protein oatmeal. So really simple. I get a quarter, about a third of a scoop of oats. I put it into a saucepan. I fill it to just a little bit above the oats with water. Um, I cook it until it's it's creamy and nice. And then I add a scoop of the Protein Works Vanilla Protein Cream, uh, Vanilla Cream Protein Powder. 
I mix it all in, I chuck it into a bowl, I add some coconut milk, some raspberries, blueberries, and um, activated almonds, which are almonds that have been soaked for 24 hours in water and then um, dehydrated, so they still retain all their nutrition. And that is my breakfast every single morning in life. And actually that's what my husband eats too. So whoever one of us makes breakfast in the morning makes it for two of us. Very simple. Oh, somebody's asked me, sorry, about gluten-free oats versus steel cut. We don't have steel cut oats in the UK. It's an American thing. They don't exist here. I use jumbo oats, we call them, which are big, uh, big oats. Uh, da, 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 da. Any tips for making seitan at home for the first time? I have never made seitan in my entire life. I don't intend to start. I buy it from souschef.co.uk. It's called roasted gluten. You soak it in water, you rehydrate it. Um, it's delicious, very versatile. I've never made it and I don't intend to because I'm far too busy. Uh, somebody's saying, who is it? Making say Yes, Gibbons ma making seitan is super easy. I know it's super easy, but I just do not have the time, nor the inclination when you can buy it so well. Do you do the ketogenic diet? And if so, how do you do it while being vegan? So I don't agree with the keto diet in principle because it's very high fat. Usually it's high fat, low protein, low carb. The thing about the keto diet is we have three macronutrients, okay? There's proteins, carbs, and fats. The reason why we have protein, carbs, and fats is because your body needs, funnily enough, proteins, carbs, and fats in order to maintain health and wellness, right? So why in God's name would we cut out one whole macro group? Why? It doesn't make sense to me to cut out one whole macro group. The reason why people go keto usually isn't for health, it's because they want to lose body fat, okay? That's why people go, it's like the celery juice cleanse. I had a rant about this last night. It's like the celery, celery juice cleanse and the aloe vera juice cleanse and the, the juice juice cleanse and the this diet and the that diet and all of these bloody fad diets that everybody jumps on because they're like, it's the latest weight loss diet. And keto, unfortunately, has become the latest weight loss diet and I think it's a little bull crap. And I think that you should avoid it like the plague. It's not conducive to building muscle. Um, you need carbohydrates in order to build muscle. Carbohydrates fuel. Carbohydrates have two, two functions, okay? Your body breaks them down into glycogen. It stores some of that glycogen in the liver to fuel the brain. It stores the rest of the glycogen in your muscles in order to fuel your muscles for whenever you lift heavy in the gym. If you do not fuel your muscles with glycogen, you will not lift as heavy in the gym, right? I see women coming into the gym. Mark, my trainer, was telling me about a woman he was working with years ago who came into the gym and she was eating four to 600 calories a day on a keto diet, right? And training for two hours a day, six days a week. And she was wondering why she was faint and lightheaded. And I was like, I just want to slap her. Like literally, why? Get a grip. Oh my God, seriously. So if, if you want to lose body fat, like, um, I, you know, Alex, okay, you're saying, do you do the ketogenic diet? And generally, people who ask about keto ask about it. Now, this may not be you, Alex, you may be asking for a different reason, but people who ask about keto generally ask about it because they want to lose body fat, okay? See, if you want to lose body fat, I'm, I'm going to, I do speak very fast, dark side, I'm sorry. I'm Irish, we speak fast, it's just the way. You're just going to have to keep up, okay? Just keep up. <laughs> so, um, the and also I like to get through a lot because there's a hell of a lot of questions to get through. So if I speak fast, I get three more. Keto diet. Here's no. Here's how you lose body fat. You ready? You eat less and you exercise more. Like, oh my god, are you like, are you all stunned? Are you all like totally blown away by this? Do you know the problem? Most people aren't willing to do what it takes in the long term to get the results that they want. They're not willing to do it with their. They're not willing to do it with their bodies. They're not willing to do it with their business. People say to me, how do you build a multi-million dollar online business? You work your ass off every single day for 14 to 16 hours a day for seven years. And then you probably will be successful. And they're like, really? But like I heard it was really easy to start an online business. Yeah, it's really easy to start one. It's very hard to make one successful. People say to me, oh, I want to have a body like you. I want to have seriously cut legs. And I'm like... Like I hear this all the time. I want to have cut legs. I'm like, you want to have cut legs? You know what you need to have to have cut legs? Like quad separation? You need to have big quads, okay? You know how you get big quads? You work hard five days a week for three to five years. That's how you get big quads. You can't go to the gym for six weeks and expect to have cut legs. It just doesn't work. We all have these crazy expectations of what it takes in order to be successful. So don't do a keto diet, okay? And you know, like I can talk a bit about keto diet and I can say, well, there's four types of keto diet. There's the regular keto, the high protein keto, the you know, the, the timed keto, the cyclical keto, and I'll explain to you what they are, okay? Regular keto is low protein, high fat. People are drinking pints of like cream, okay? Blah, like vomit, okay? 
The, the next one is the high protein keto diet, which is actually what we do in my four week shred program. So my four week shred program, if you want to pick one up, four week shred dot four, the sculpted vegan.com forward slash four week shred. Okay. I think we actually have the domain four week shred.com as well. I think we bought it just because so many people were searching for it. So you can just go to four week shred.com. You'll get the four week shred. Um, it's a high protein keto diet. Okay. High protein um, means that we, we eat very low fat, very high protein and very low carb for four weeks, okay? It's not a lifestyle, it's a diet designed to get short-term results to boost your healthy lifestyle, to kickstart your healthy lifestyle. It's not supposed to be a long-term solution. Cyclical keto, otherwise known as carb cycling. Carb cycling is cyclical keto, right? That's what it is. Timed keto, that's what I do when I'm prepping. Timed keto is where you eat most of your white starchy carbs around your training. You eat your white starchy carbs before you train because that's what fuels the muscle, right? That makes the lifts heavy, makes the lifts easier. And then you eat your white starchy carbs after training, which then causes um, your muscles to be refueled with, with carbohydrates. So that those are the four types of keto. And the reason why people are asking about keto though is generally because they want to lose body fat. See, if you want to lose body fat, just be prepared to be in it for the long haul. If you can consistently do cardio every single day. And in fact, see it, if every single person watching this wanted to lose body fat, I challenge you, okay? I challenge you to add cardio to change nothing else in your diet. Don't change anything you eat. Don't change anything else you do, but add cardio into your diet, okay? Add cardio into your regime. If you if you went for a 60-minute walk or even like a five-kilometer walk, okay? Five-kilometer walk, six days a week for four weeks, you would drop about six to eight percent body fat. Boom. I'm telling you, more exercise, and that assumes that you don't actually already walk or do any cardio. If you go from sedentary to cardio, your body will drop body fat. The thing is though, if you want to get a body like mine or you want to do it in the long term, you have to be in it for the long haul. Okay? You can't like you're not gonna have your perfect body in four weeks, six weeks. Hell, you're not even gonna have it in eight weeks, not even four months. People someone wrote to me today and said, you know, oh Kim, you know, how long did it take for you to, you know, I, I want to have your body. How long did it take you? And I'm like, three years. And they're like, really? Three years? And I'm like, yeah, three years. I didn't look like this two years ago. It's taken me three years of working harder than anyone you've ever met, probably, unless you know another competitive bodybuilder. That's what it took to get my body. And most people think, oh yeah, I can train for like, you know, six weeks, 12 weeks, three months. No, people. I'm not here to lie to you. I'm here to tell you the truth. It's going to take far longer than you think. So forget about keto. Forget about celery juice. Forget about carb cycling. Just commit. Commit to going to the gym four to five times a week. Commit to cardio four to five times a week. And commit to eating better, planning your food in my fitness pal, working out your TDEE, and then being at a slight deficit of your total daily energy expenditure, TDEE. And you will get there if you stay in it for the long haul. If you don't, you're not going to achieve your goals and you're going to be constantly looking for the latest fad diet to get you results and it ain't going to happen. Okay, little rant, little rant. <laughs> oh, but thanks for the question. Thanks for the question. Um, okay, this is a good one. So did your skin break out when you started following a vegan diet? Mine has, it's been two years. No, my skin has never broken out. Sometimes my skin, um, whenever I get very low body fat, which I am at the minute because I'm four weeks out from competition, then my skin sometimes starts to break out. But what people don't realize is your body stores toxins in fat, okay? So your liver is your biggest is the biggest fat-burning organ of the body. So your liver has these little things called cuffer cells, right? Cuffer cells, which is spelled with a K, cuffer cells go around your liver. And I imagine them to be like Pac-Man. Anyone here old enough to remember Pac-Man? Nom, 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 nom. Like Pac-Man went around like eating the dots and then you had to like get away from the monsters. It was very early game. I, we loved Pac-Man. So um, Pac-Man, I imagine these copper cells would be like Pac-Man, right? They go around your they go around your liver and they, they, they eat up all the toxins, right? So we ingest toxins. We put toxins on our skin. We put toxins on our hair. We breathe in toxins. We drink toxins. Toxins go into our body. It's our liver's job to deal with those toxins, okay? So your liver has these things called copper cells. Copper cells are like the waste collection service of your liver. So they go around your liver, eating up all of the cup, eating up all of the toxins, and then the cover cells dispose of the toxins into the digestive system. Right? Digestive system is the primary um, toxin clearing mechanism of the body. However, many people do not have a very efficient digestive system. 
feel, I hear sometimes people say to me that they don't go, um, they don't go to the bathroom for like a week. And I'm like, you go to the bathroom once a week. You should go to the bathroom. Okay. You should be pooping three times a day. And your stool should be the length from your wrist to your elbow and the circumference of from you. Oh, my husband's iPad ringing. And um, whenever you put your little finger in the crease of your thumb, that is, should be the circumference of it. Okay. So from your wrist to your elbow and this circumference, three times a day, not once a week. So if you don't have a very efficient digestive system, what is going to happen is your digestive system is not going to be able to clear out all the toxins. The toxins are going to be reabsorbed back into your system. The toxins then get carried back into the bloodstream, back to the liver. The liver then has to try and deal with the new onslaught of toxins, plus the old ones that the blood has just come through. Your liver cleanses your blood, two pints of blood every hour, three pints whenever you've just eaten, okay? It then what it does is it tries to dump the toxins back into your digestive system. If it, and it also sends anything that is water soluble, it sends to your kidneys to eliminate through your sweat, your skin, obviously via your sweat, and your urine, right? But the problem is if we don't have a very efficient system, right? If we don't take care of ourselves, if we eat a lot of saturated fat, if we eat a lot of sugar, if we don't exercise, because exercise is very good for efficiently getting your body to sweat a lot. It's very good for moving the blood around the body, moving the blood into the muscle tissues. The, the better the blood flow around your body, then the more your body is going to be, is going to get rid of toxins. Where am I going with this? Well, whenever your body can't get rid of toxins because you don't have a very efficient digestive system, you're not very healthy, you're lying on your lazy ass basically doing nothing, or you're just not moving as much as you should, you're eating a lot of crap, you're self-medicating with a lot of alcohol, you know, because go back to original point about university, you're miserable in your life, you hate your job, and you live for the weekend when you can just get drunk and party, then your body's going to be quite toxic. You're not going to be eliminating toxins sufficiently, and so therefore your body's going to become unhealthy. Your body has to store the toxins somewhere. If your liver can't get rid of them, through your digestive system or the, or the urine, and there's too many toxins in your system, your body has to store them. Where does your body store them? In fat cells. Yes, in fat cells. So your body starts dumping toxins into fat cells because fat cells are a very good place to store toxins because they're just cells that don't need, they, they're not like living cells. They're just like big blobs of fat. Okay, they're basically storehouses of energy. That's what fat cells are. They're, we, we hate fat, but actually fat is very useful because it's a storehouse of energy. So what happens? Why do you get breakouts whenever you get low body fat or whenever you go vegan or you start to change your lifestyle? Because your body now goes, oh, this is wonderful. Uh, we have a much more efficient system so we can start to break down some of those fat cells, release those toxins and get those toxins out. So now that I'm getting into very low body fat, my body is breaking down fat cells that some of those fat cells contain toxins and then that for come, that, then you get breakouts in your skin. And sometimes I get a few breakouts in my arms not very often. And I don't like, you can see my skin's really clear. I don't get bad breakouts at all, but that is generally what causes breakouts. Also inflammation is a massive cause of breakouts. So I wasn't well there for a few weeks. I wasn't really that ill, not enough to stop training, but I knew that I had like a bit of a sore head, sore sinuses. And after I had been ill, I got, I got a rash an inflammation rash just around my chin. This is where I always get a rash. And a rash is always the sign of the end of a sign of the end of, um, the end of a virus. So whenever you have a virus in your system, then you can get some kind of rash. But a virus is basically just inflammation. So if your body is inflamed, which meant for many of us it is because we don't have healthy lifestyles, or maybe we have an illness, then you're going to get um, you're going to get breakouts. So that is what can cause breakouts. So it's not always to do with the vegan diet. It's rarely to do with the vegan diet. It's usually to do with something else going on in the system. Uh, what do you eat after you work out? This is very easy. I always take uh, 50 grams of protein with uh, one scoop of Vitargo, V-I-T-A-R-G-O. It's a high molecular weight carbohydrate, which is absorbed instantly through the small intestine into the bloodstream and carried to the muscles for energy. I have one scoop on upper body day and two scoops on lower body day. Vitargo with 50 grams of protein. I also put in lucian, creatine, and L-glutamine a big heat teaspoon of each. And that's what I have every single day after I train. I don't, I don't really care what I eat. It's more my protein shape that I need to get in. Great question. Okay, what does your water manipulation strategy look like? Okay, so this is for competition. So what I do, um, what we bodybuilders do whenever we are competing is the week, peak week we call it, the week before competition is when you dehydrate. So what you wanna do is you wanna dehydrate to try and get the um, the water away from underneath the skin so that you look more cut, right? So that's basically why bodybuilders on show day look amazing because they're dehydrated. A lot of people take um, 
uh, take diuretics, but I prefer not to take diuretics because you know you can do it with water really easily. So what you have to remember two things is uh, water always follows salt, right? So what we do first of all is we load up on salt for the first half of the week. So you salt everything, you need as much salt as you possibly can because then your body will suck in a lot of water. And then from the Wednesday before the show on the Saturday or the Sunday, you cut salt out of your diet entirely because water follows salt. So when you cut salt out entirely, the water will leave your body as the salt does because you've, you know, you're not taking any salt. So your body doesn't need to bring in any water in order to process the salt. I usually start off with um, three liters on the Monday and then I go to, so I'm drinking three liters of water. Then I go to four liters on the Tuesday, five liters on the Wednesday, six liters on the Thursday, seven liters on the Friday, and then eight, if the show is on the Sunday, I'll drink eight liters on the Saturday. If it's uh, the show is on the Saturday, then I'll just go up to seven liters on the Friday, seven or eight liters. People say to me, how, so two questions, how on earth do you drink seven or eight liters of water in a day? Well, I aim to drink um, 500 mils, which is a pint of water every, th every 60 minutes. So I go downstairs in the morning at 8am, I pick up a pint and I go, Blub, 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 down. Okay, and I go one. And I actually keep it. We have like a chalkboard in the kitchen, so I keep a tally on the chalkboard. You never go far from a toilet in peak week because literally you pee every single hour. So you can never go on a long car journey because when you need to go, you need to go. So peak week, you never wander hard, far from home. So if you do um half a pint every every hour, so you'll do um every two hours, you'll be having one liter basically. So then, you know, so over a two, four, six, eight, over a four hour period, you will have drunk um, for, I'm trying to figure out actually how, how, is it, or is it half, a, is it a pint every half an hour? I can't honestly remember what it is that I do and I can't do the math because I'm live and I'm not thinking about it. But anyway, between the hours of nine in the morning and, and five in the afternoon, you've generally got in eight liters. Yeah, it's one liter every hour, one, a pint every half an hour. So it's one liter every hour. So between, if I start at nine and I finish at five and I drink one liter every hour, you get eight liters in between nine and five. Now you, you do pee, not pee all night, you pee once or twice during the night. But what that does is, um, the reason why that works to dehydrate your body, you would think it would be the opposite because you would think that drinking loads of water would stop you from dehydrating. But what it does is your body, because you're flooding your body with water, your body goes, oh my God, oh my God, like it starts to panic because there's so much water coming in. So because there's so much water coming in and it has to process the water, it starts to drop water like crazy from everywhere. It drops it from under your skin. It drops it from your organs because the, you're pouring water into your body. So there's loads and loads of fresh water coming in. So your body starts to drop loads and loads of water. You do have to, though, just make sure that you watch your sodium and potassium levels because you're, that's why you salt everything in the first half of the week because your kidney is responsible for balancing your sodium and potassium levels. So you, and if you're flooding your kidneys with water, you just want to make sure I always take potassium um, every, I take about uh, 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 500 milligrams of potassium every three hours for the whole of peak week, just to make sure that my body's getting enough potassium. So that's my water drop strategy. And then by the end of the week, like your body changes every day, whenever you're doing water drop, uh, water loading, you also call it. And then by the end of the week, you literally look cut, like your skin is so dry. Like if you pull out the skin on your, on your stomach, like it takes eight, like an old person, you can pull it out and it like takes ages to go back in because there's really very little water below the skin. You would be shocked at how much water is actually below your skin. It's unbelievable. How confident are you re upcoming shows? I am very confident and I'll tell you why. Two reasons. Um, one, I'm always out to win. Um, two, I love being on stage and I feel extremely confident when I'm up there. Three, my body has so much muscle this year that I actually have to be careful not to get too lean because if I get too lean, then they'll move me up from bikini. So it's not how much muscle you have in bikini, it's how ripped you get. If your body is ripped and you have vascularity and you have striations, like I will have striations in my shoulders, right? Because there's me not ripped, but like I have striations on my shoulders, I always do. And like I have like veins on my chest and stuff. See my chest? But I, I don't have really ripped abs. I never, ever have. Like I have good abs, I'll show you. A good, good, um... I have good obliques here. So I have all of these like cut obliques, but like I don't have, because I've had four kids, so I can have this skin here. So I have to be very, I have to do this. So watch, so people say to me, how do you get abs, right? Well, there's me standing normally, okay? So I have skin, see? So there's, now I have good abs there. But look, like if I do this, like, look, look at my stomach, loads of skin. And I always have this little, like there's a little bit of fat or water underneath there, not much, but like it's certainly not cut. But then people say to me, how do you get good abs? And I watch, you ready? Hips back. Like what happens to your stomach when you put your hips back? So this is how I said, this is why I'm always preaching in all of my programs. We have a program called howtopose.com. And I always say to them, hips back, hips back, hips back. Whenever you put your hips back like this, then suddenly look, 
then you have abs. I know the light's coming in and it's in a bad thing. So hips back gives you abs, hips forward, abs disappear. See, always depends on the light as well. But there's always, always tips and tricks to show your body off to the best light. So I am very confident. The other thing as well is two other reasons. This year I'm sponsored by Angel Competition Bikinis who really make the most incredible bikinis. Um, actually, if you put in Kim, if you're checking out and you put in, if you buy an Angel Competition bikini and you put Kim Constable into the uh, checkout box, they'll send you a free set of jewelry. So you get free jewelry as well because um, I am one of their sponsored athletes. So my two, my bikinis that I bought are like, they are like spectacular. Like just to give you an idea, the order that I checked out whenever I whenever I ordered my bikini was seventeen hundred dollars. So that was for two bikinis, a robe, which says the sculpted vegan on the back, um, and also um, the jewelry as well. It was $1,700. So you can imagine just how incredible the um, the bikinis are. They're phenomenal. So, and also, even if I don't win, which I would hope to, um, I know that I have worked my ass off this year. There's nothing more I could do to prepare. My posing is on point. My body is on point. You know, I have, you know, hair extensions and my tan is like perfect. You know, like there's nothing I could have done more. So I'm always happy. If I know there's nothing I could have done more and I didn't cheat on my diet and I was like the best that I could be. If I win, I win. If I don't, I don't. I don't compete to win. I compete because it supports my business. So, and I just love it. So I, whether I win or not, doesn't matter to me. I'm not like, it's not the be all and end all for me, but I am very confident. Um, okay, this is a good one. Are your kids strictly vegan? Nope, only one of my ch children is strictly vegan. The other one, is, the other three are vegetarian by choice. Uh, funny story, actually. I always say to people that, um, you know, whenever you choose to do something, you'll either choose to do it because you have the value for it or because it's a rule, okay? And so my, my son Kai is really, really into animals like he loves animals and he is so passionate about animals and protecting animals and whatever so he whenever he became vegan um you know he became vegan because he he wanted to become vegan because he really could not stand eating animals okay and or, or eating any animal products he really wanted to protect the animals so but what happened was he began to because his his brothers and sisters were still vegetarian the things that Kai used to love were like ice cream and different you know um potato chips and things that he would have loved that you know had milk in them and pringles and different things you know and it, so there were so many foods that he really really missed and he began to become punishing towards other other kids so he would say you know he would you know, just little jabs about what they eat or he would say oh i can't believe she's eating that do you know how many animals have died so you can have this like you know and i was like oh there's something going on here so usually whenever we punish something in someone else it's because we have a rule about that thing so if i have a rule that eating sugar is bad if i see you eating sugar i will punish you for eating sugar so i'll, I'll just make little comments about it. like we all have a have a we all have a family member who does this or a husband or a wife or a mother or whatever who is like you know always you know like punishing you for eating something or whatever so they, they'll see you like you know eating and they'll be like oh you know like every time I swear, my husband hates me swearing. So every time I swear, he like, you know, like, oh, and like he always comments on it and is like, you know, God, you've got such a, you know, terrible mouth, you're always swearing. And uh, because he has an issue about swearing. So every time he sees me do the thing, then it causes him a bit of pain. So he wants to stop me from doing it to make the pain go away. So that's why we do things whenever we have a rule about something. So if I have a rule, if I was punished as a child and told that, you know, you shouldn't eat sweets and eating candy is bad and you shouldn't eat sugar then I will have some kind of fear-based rule around sugar. So whenever I see you eating sugar, I'll, I'll have to comment on it. And I'll have to say, Jasmine, who loves eating sugar, I'll say, Jasmine, do you realize how bad that is for you? I mean, look at you, Jasmine. Like, look at how much sugar you eat. I mean, or do you know how many calories are in that? Like, I just feel compelled to make you feel bad about eating the sugar. Because in some way, I, the, you eating the sugar brings up my pain. And I think that if I can stop you from doing the thing, the pain will go away, Okay. So anyway, I noticed him starting to do this and I thought, oh, he has this rule around, around veganism. He has this rule around it because he's punishing others. So I said to him one day, I said, right, Kai, I think we should go and break all our rules because I always encourage my kids to break all their rules. OK, so I say to them, you know, um, you know, if you have a rule around something, it's not an ethic. If you have an ethic around something, it's just it's part of you. You don't feel need to you don't feel the need to explain or to justify. So I I noticed that it was like for him and he was punishing. So I said to him, let's go break all our rules. And he said, what do you mean? And I said, I think we should go for ice cream, like like proper. I, let, let's go to Spoon Street, which is like a place where you go and you put, you know, it's like frozen yogurt and you put like all your toppings and stuff on. And he was like, 
no, but we can't, but I can't because we're vegan. And I was like, let's not be vegan today. Let's, let's break all our rules, you and me. So I decided that I was going to go with them and we were going to break all our rules. So we went to Spoon Street and we had non-vegan ice cream and we loaded it with toppings. And he was like, are you serious? And I was like, yes, I really think we should. So then we had pizza with real cheese and we had garlic bread with real butter. And we, all of these things that he loves that he was missing so badly. We did, and I, I went with him and I was like, let's break all our rules. And so we broke all our rules and it just released him from the freedom of, of this rule he had placed on himself around veganism. And so then he, he said to me, you know, after a couple of days, he said to me, I'm not going to be vegan anymore. I'm going to be vegetarian. I said, no problem, sweetheart. You, you, I think you should, if that's the right choice for you and you miss all these foods, then totally, I think that, that, you know, that's the right choice. So he was like vegetarian, I think for about four days. And then he came back to me and he said, mommy, he said, I can't do it. I'm not, I'm, I need to go back to being vegan. He said, I just, every time I eat cheese or I eat, you know, butter or whatever, he said, I just can't, I just think of the animals and I just can't. And I said, well, there, I said, then you should, you know, I said, if that's right for you, then absolutely, I fully support your decision. So it was amazing because now he doesn't punish anyone. He doesn't punish anyone for anything. He is so true to himself and his decision to be a vegan and so strong in his in his choice to be a vegan. He, he you know, forfeits everything that he used to love. Um, and of course, I try and support him in any way I can. We buy vegan magnums. We buy vegan ice cream. Like I have, obviously I'm vegan, but I don't eat all that stuff anyway. But I will, you know, always, 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 if I bring the kids back chocolate because they do eat chocolate, then I will buy him, make sure I get him loads of different types of vegan chocolate and vegan Easter eggs and vegan, you know, advent calendars. And I'm really, you know, um, really, really passionate, you know, about supporting him. But it was it was a beautiful process to watch because he he found his ethics, right? It, it was a, it was an it was an ethic for him, but there was a lot of rule, a lot of fear based rules around it. And so once we broke all those rules and people write to me, oh, but you're vegan and you get ice cream. I'm like, yeah, my son not having a rule and not having some kind of fear based rule is so much more important to me than than eating than not eating dairy a hundred percent like if you want to judge me for that you go on ahead because truly i don't give a shit <laughs> you can judge me all you want people judge me every single day i am totally happy with my decision to on my veganism and my choice of veganism and what i choose to do with it and not do with it i people judging me makes no bearing on my life whatsoever so um so yes yeah, so that's what we did so i would say to you guys like anyone who has like rules around things if you have like some kind of rule and you feel the urge to punish someone for eating cheese this is where i see all these judgy vegans right oh you what do you think of the animals you're killing and you know these poor non-vegans go into these these facebook groups right and they went to these vegan Facebook groups because they're interested in exploring veganism. So they go in and they think, I would really like to be a vegan. So what's the first thing a non-vegan does whenever they, they're maybe thinking about transitioning maybe one day vegan or thinking about exploring veganism? What do they do? Well, you go on Facebook and you find a group of vegans and you think, I'm going to join the group of vegans. Because everybody who isn't a vegan has this lovely mindset or this, this thought in their mind that vegans are really lovely, sweet people, right? That, well, they must be because they love the animals, okay? So they think they must be like the loveliest, sweetest, friendliest people in the world. And so, so they join these vegan groups. And let me tell you, they are stunned. You know why? Because most vegans are the judgiest, meanest, nastiest bunch of bastards you'll ever come across in your entire life. And I am horrified by what I see going on in those vegan groups. Horrified. Because someone comes in and goes, you know, uh, oh, you know, I just was wondering, you know, I, I, sometimes I have a real craving for cheese and I just wondered, has anybody like broke their veganism and, you know, and just like given in and had cheese and like everyone jumps on them and goes like, you know, sorry, someone else is saying you're talking so fast. Sorry, I talk fast. Like seriously, keep up. Just keep up. I talk fast. So, um, so they go, but they jump on them. They're like, do you know that you're murdering the animals? Just think of all the animals that have died, the mothers that have been impregnated and stripped of their babies so you can have cream. And I'm like, oh my God, like what a way to put someone off veganism. Seriously? Like you're gonna like smash them over the head with a brick for like saying they had cheese on their pizza? Like I just think seriously people, and I just go, there's a lot of very fearful vegans in the world, very fearful or very uneducated. They really don't know how to talk to people. So people will listen. They really don't know how to influence people. You know how you influence people? You lead by example. You talk passionately about your subject. You you don't judge people. You leave it open for them to feel safe to step into your world and wade around in it and explore it without judgment, without fear. People aren't people don't eat meat because they want to kill the animals. People eat meat because they've been conditioned to eat meat. Okay? Like just like years ago, slavery 
was perfectly acceptable. It's perfectly acceptable. Today, eating meat is perfectly acceptable, not because people love going around and slaughtering animals, but because it's it's societal norm. It's what's always been done. It's what people did, but you know, that's why it's it's normal to drink cow's milk and it's not normal to drink dog milk. Okay? It's just because we have been conditioned this way. So you can't judge people for their conditioning. You can't judge people because they haven't thought or they're not as educated about you as veganism. What you need to do is just is just be the change, like as Gandhi said, be the change you want to be in the world. Just by leading by example, by showing up every single day, by being consistent, and but most of all, by being loving, kind, and gentle, okay? The more you are loving, kind, and gentle with yourself, the more you are loving, kind, and gentle with other people in the world, right? And there are many, many facets of veganism. Someone is saying, what about clothes or leather? Like, it's, you know, there's a lot of vegans who are evangelical vegans who are like, full vegan like people are like oh vegan means this i'm sorry vegan doesn't somebody once decided words words are made up by human beings okay we made up words and we made up the meanings of words okay so vegan has been defined in the dictionary in a certain way okay that doesn't mean that that is all that a vegan is there are many 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 different types of vegans there are vegans who are all in won't use animal products will won't even won't even you know use an antibiotic in a hospital because let me tell you see every time you take a headache tablet it's been tested on an animal i'm sorry but it has every time you take an antibiotic it's been tested on an animal every time you vaccinate your child that the vaccination bacteria has been has been grown usually or has some kind of embryo of an animal in it they can't grow them in humans and then extract them. They have to grow them in animals. So it's very hard to be completely 100% vegan. So some people are fully vegan. Some people are, you know, plant-based, which means they only eat plants, but they still wear leather and wear wool and wear cashmere and, you know, all of the things. And some of them eat honey because they don't believe the bees are harmed. Therefore, you know, some people are more do more harm. Some people you know, like me, believe that a lot of the stuff like leather is a byproduct of the animal industry, okay? If we didn't kill cows for meat, we wouldn't have leather. We would never kill cows for leather because it's too expensive. Leather is a byproduct of the animal industry. So therefore, if you go to the source and you stop eating the animals, a lot of the other things would cease to exist. So for me, I prefer to go to the source. So, But people have different views on different things. And so, um, you know, anyway, but it's important that for, for children especially that you don't slap a rule on them, that you leave it open to them to explore because when you leave it open to the child to explore, to make up their own mind about something, then you have a much better chance of the child actually sticking to whatever it is that they are passionate about and to really truly making it a part of themselves, making it a part of their internal ethics. And when it's a part of their internal ethics, it stays with them for life. Okay, here's a good one. What do you do for fun? What do you like to do for fun when you're not training? You're going to find me a bit weird, okay? But I don't really, um, for me, work is fun, okay? I, I, every time, every single minute that I'm not training, I am either with my family, with my husband, but with my family, either with my kids, with my sisters and my mom, or I'm working in my business. Because for me, working in my business is fun. That's like, I love work. And I feel so grateful that my children are being brought up with two parents who love their work. My husband is an agent, uh, like Jerry Maguire. So he's like the Jerry Maguire of the rugby world. He's, he has um, a sports management company. Um, he used to be a professional rugby player. So he loves his work. He loves what he does. And I love what I do. So whenever, to be honest, we are not, and whenever I'm not training and in the gym, and I'm not spending time with my kids. I'm working. I'm here. This is work for me. This is a live Q&A, right? This is all to do with, with me, with, with my personal brand, with growing my business, with expanding the, the reach of veganism and, and this knowledge. And here it is. It's a Sunday evening and it's nearly six o'clock and I have to go and get my kids dinner now. But this this is me. This is what I do for fun. I connect with you guys and I answer questions and I share knowledge, okay? The price of attention is is enormous and I never take for granted the attention that I have. I have a lot of attention on me. And so while people are, it's like the movie, what did you, what was that movie recently with um, Lady Gaga in it, uh, A Star is Born? Like he said, you know, if people are listening, like it, you don't know how long they're gonna be listening for. So if you've got something to say and people are listening, you say it and you say it in your way. So that, that really touched me that line. And I just think, you know, that this is what I do for fun. I don't have, like, I'm, I honestly, what else do I do that's fun? I see friends. Like I don't, there's nothing else that I do that is fun because I just work because work for me is fun. <laughs> this is really funny. And I have to, I actually have to bring this one up. How do you deal with the exorbitant amount of gas my family is about to kill me? 
So a lot of people think that when they that when they start a bodybuilder diet, it's actually the, the vegetables that make them fart a lot. It's really not. It's actually the protein, okay? So protein farts are the worst. Every bodybuilder knows that when you start taking in lots of protein, you start to fart a lot. And there really is no way to sugarcoat it or make it seem like it's not happening. When you take in a lot of protein, you fart a lot. Bottom line, how do you deal with it? Your body does acclimate over time. So it does get less, but if you change your protein quite often or you eat a different type of protein, you'll start farting again. How do you deal with it? You just get used to it and you just fart. Uh, you try not to do it in public. You try and do it before you go to bed or wait till your husband's asleep. But really, seriously, you just gotta be prepared by the fact that you're gonna fart a lot. Um, it's just part of, the, it's part of bodybuilding and there's nothing you can do to, but like seriously, like I was gonna answer another question. I was having something like, where did, we, where did we learn that farting is bad, okay? Farting is just literally, it's like burping. It's just passing gas. But like, especially Americans, I'm sorry, but like I'm Irish, okay? But I've spent a lot of time in America and you guys are crazy. You guys are like, you know, I, I went to America once and I went, my, my husband and I were staying in America and we, were, we went to like, we were staying in a friend's house and we went to one of these like communal pools they have. So there's like this, this like nice, nice leafy suburb neighborhood and they have like this big pool in the middle. It's like a club thing and everyone goes in. We walked in there with our two kids. We weren't there more than five minutes and we had broken nearly every single rule in the place. First of all, we walked in bare feet. Oh, you're not allowed that, okay? Not allowed that. Because like apparently you're not allowed to walk in America. You're not allowed to walk in public places in bare feet. Like seriously? <laughs> so we went out to the pool, okay? Now my kids understand we're, we're two and three at the time. So I just pulled off their clothes, stripped them off and people were like, oh no, 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 you can't change your kids here. I was like, but he's, he's two, like he, it's a two-year-old penis, like it's so small, you can't even say it. No, no, you have to go to the changing room. You can't change your kids. And if you, you can't be naked in a public place. You can't be, you don't have your two-year-old naked in a public place. Are you kidding me? So I was like, dear God. So then one of my kids was like, mommy, I really, really need to pee. And I was like, just go down to that bush. And you know, which was far away from me. Just go down there and just pee in the bush. Oh my God. People are like, somebody needs to go pee pee. Somebody needs to go pee pee. Like this woman started freaking out because like my three-year-old is peeing in a bush. And I'm like, but, but no, not a lot. Not allowed to be in a bush in America either. So then we went, like there was then there was a diving pool. Not allowed to swim. Not like my three year old was jumping off the diving board, and he could. He's a good swimmer. You had to swim all the way to the end of the pool before and get out before the next person could go. I said, why can't he just swim to the side and get out? No, 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 not allowed to do that. Not allowed to like set your kids on half of the slide. You have to have to be able to climb all the way up the slide and come all the way down. I am Irish, and we don't have a lot of rules here. Uh, now over here, if you're stopped for speeding. The policeman will saunter up to your car and he'll say, hey, what are you doing? And I'll be like, oh, I'm really sorry. And he goes, do you know what you did wrong? I go, yeah, I was going a wee bit too fast. Yeah, I'm going a wee bit too fast. Uh, I think you were talking on your phone. No, officer, I swear to God it wasn't. I think you were. Do you have your license on you? And I'm like, oh, all right, okay. So, you know, you take out your license and you have a bit of banter, right? A bit of crack with the policeman. Oh my God, not in America. No, he's like, get out of the car. What are you doing? What are you doing over there? Really? I was like, holy shit. Like, he honestly he said to me, I honestly nearly laughed. He was so aggressive. And like, hey, so listen, guys, I will never live in America. You guys are nuts. And you're so aggressive and you have so many rules. Um, but I do love Americans. Like, you're so idealistic. <laughs> it's so beautiful. But um, but yeah, but anyway, uh, guys, it's telling me I only have one minute and 30 seconds left. So I've obviously been chatting for far too long. So I'm gonna have to go. Thank you so much for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed it. I would love it if you would leave me a comment and let me know which part resonated with you the most. Which part did you most enjoy? I would also adore you forever if you subscribe and share this video with your friends. See you next time.